Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today where we're going to discuss uh, building collaborative research networks. Uh, I've got some of my colleagues with me and, and they'll be talking a little bit later on and then of course there'll be opportunities to ask questions and we'll try and really get the conversation going and we don't expect to finish it today but we certainly hope that we can uh, sow some seeds and uh, some interesting ideas about how and why it is important to build uh, collaborative research activities uh, and the potential impact of doing that. Now, of course, I'm going to draw on the experience of uh, our ARC Centre of Excellence for Electromaterial Science, uh, but hopefully a lot of the things we have to say today and discuss today uh, will be generically uh, applicable. So once I find the mouse. So we're talking about building research collaborations in, in particular today, and I'd like to address several points in my introductory presentation, you know, why you would build uh, collaborative research activities, some ideas about how you might go about doing that, uh, and everyone will have different ideas around that, and it, it would be good to share them. Uh, when do you do that? Uh, a very important uh, decision that we do this uh, as a conscious part of a, a bigger plan, uh, and so we need to be thinking about that bigger plan and, and determine when we initiate collaborations. And of course, very important, uh, once initiated, how do we sustain, maintain those collaborations and monitor progress and, and measure success and, and rejig things accordingly to ensure that that success continues. So first of all, why would you build uh, collaborative research activities? Uh, I think we're all very aware in today's highly multidisciplinary uh, research environment, that it's important that we draw on the best skills from other areas outside of our own, uh, and that we draw on those skills uh, from our peers that might be in the same organization as us, or, or in a, a, a partner organization in the case of ACES, or indeed an international collaborator in the case of ACES. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that by collaborating, we bring together uh, a mountain of skills that's not possible uh, to acquire through just uh, an individual or even just through a small uh, group activity. And, and not only the skills, but different ways of thinking about R&D, different ways of confronting uh, particular challenges. Uh, uh, we, we all confront research in a, in a different way, and it's important that we share and learn about uh, how we address those challenges from each other uh, so that we can optimize the particular approach uh, to any particular problem. And the other practical thing, of course, is just access to international resources. There are many uh, techniques uh, that, that are not available uh, in your home institution, and it's important to have access to those experimental approaches by building uh, collaborations. And, you know, in the bigger picture, it's very important that we address big challenges uh, using big global teams. And so as part of ACES, we have some really big challenges that we're confronting in, in medical devices and energy. And it's important that we draw on our, uh, our partners and on our, uh, our, our partners and collaborators from around the world to make sure that we can do that in the most effective way possible. And the other practical thing from, for all of us at different stages of our career, of course, is that these collaborative networks give rise uh, to an effective employment uh, and recruitment network. Uh, when we're looking for new skills to bring into ACES, uh, we look primarily or first of all through our collaborative networks to do that. Uh, and when our partners are looking to recruit people, uh, they're also looking uh, for that collaborative network uh, as a first port of call in identifying potential people to recruit. Now, setting up collaborations does take time. It requires an investment of time and energy and resources. Uh, and, and as you would expect, it comes down to those personal relationships and building effective collaborations. The key to success of any collaboration is, is not just the match of technical skills that I talked about before or access to equipment. All of that only really works if the, if the personal relationships uh, are in place, if people share the same technical vision, share the same goals, understand and respect the importance of collaborative research. Uh, if you can get that match in potential partners, then that really is uh, the key to success uh, in collaborations.
And just in terms of, of how, of course, there are many different ways to go about setting up collaborations. And I just want to raise a few points here, as I say, drawing on the, the example of our ARC Center of Excellence. Uh, and But this is a really important point, I think, and that is you don't have to build collaborative networks from the ground up. Uh, Australia is actually highly effective. Australian researchers are highly effective in terms of building collaborative research networks and have been doing so for the last 30 years or more. And so these, there's amazing networks that you can tap into at uh, whatever stage of career you might be at. Uh, centers of excellence are a good starting point. Uh, but for example, we have links to other uh, centers of excellence that have great complementary expertise and skills in the areas that we're interested in, in, in these medical devices uh, and in new energy devices as well. So I'd encourage you to tap in uh, to whatever centers of excellence are most appropriate uh, to the particular skills that you're trying to identify. Cooperative research centers, another highly successful uh, organization, uh, organizational structure within Australia. And remember that you're not just tapping into that particular cooperative research center through engagement with whatever CRC is appropriate to you. You're tapping into a whole myriad of different types of industries and you're engaging with different types of industries by uh, tapping into that existing collaborative research network. There's ARC training hubs as well, uh, linkage hubs, for example, for research uh, or for training. Uh, we've recently commenced one of those uh, with some partners around Australia at QUT and Deakin and RMIT and involving again this list of companies and end users involved in those training hubs. So networks already in place that you can tap into immediately uh, in order to save time and more effectively and efficiently build new collaborative opportunities. Uh, others within uh, ACES, other CIs, uh, particularly based at Deakin, are involved in the Future Fibres Hub. And again, you can see how you can tap into a completely different uh, commercial network, uh, and yet you can do that through the contacts uh, that you have within, within ACES. Just touching on the medical front for at the moment, just uh, and again to impress on you uh, the, the networks that do exist uh, and, and these networks have been built up over decades. So you, you really, uh, it's important that everybody does utilize uh, these networks and utilize them for their particular areas of collaborative research. So I won't go through all of these clinical collaborators, uh, starting with Professor Graham Clark though. Uh, Graham did initiate uh, all of our synthetic biosystems work and led that uh, for many years and has really helped us to establish this clinical network uh, around the country initially and now expanding that network internationally as well. So if you're in the medical area and you need to talk to people uh, who are engaged as end users, as clinicians uh, and looking for new technologies or engaged in uh, describing medical challenges that your technologies might be able to address, uh, there are networks already in place. And similarly in the energy area, uh, links to a whole lot of end users a diverse array of end users from different commercial sectors uh, are in place and, and accessible uh, through the, the ACES, ACES network. And of course the international linkages, uh, we have five international partners uh, set up already and signed up for collaborative research activities. Uh, we have individuals identified within those five universities, but the whole university is signed up and so if you identify other individuals that are not necessarily named as partner investigators. They can very quickly uh, be signed up as associate investigators of ACES. And again, we can expand that collaborative network uh, to accommodate particular interests and particular challenges that might be at hand. So there's just some indications and I have emphasized under my how banner uh, this necessity and, and opportunity to tap into existing networks. It, it really is a, a great opportunity that didn't exist uh, for us 20 years ago. And so I'd encourage you to look at tapping into that. And then there's the question of, of when, we're all at different stages of our career. So, so what's important about identifying the most appropriate time to initiate a collaborative activity? Uh, well, obviously, and I'll, I'll come back to this, it, it's important that the collaborations are introduced at a time that they facilitate 
the development of this more strategic goal. So each individual, we've all been to interviews where they say, where do you want to be in five or 10 years time? Well, you know, this is a good opportunity to practice that and have that clear in your mind because it's that, that vision, it's, it's those goals that really dictate who you should collaborate with, but also when you should collaborate with them. Uh, and I think it's important as well in, in, in building those collaborations that you look around within your own organization and see how you can gain support uh, for those collaborations, for developing those collaborations, because they will uh, expend considerable uh, resources uh, and considerable time uh, on your part. So a lot of things have to line up. Uh, planets really do have to align to get the right collaborations. But let me go back and re-emphasize. I talked about how before and the importance of the individuals. Uh, and that's true uh, for the when also, because there's no point uh, initiating a collaboration if those right people uh, are not available. Uh, they may have all the technical skills, but some of these other interpersonal skills are equally as important in developing those collaborative activities. Where my arrow go? Here it is. Uh, and there's no shying away from the fact that investing in building collaborations may well cost you in terms of, of output, particularly in the early stages of your career. Uh, but investing in collaborations will dramatically uh, improve not just the quantity uh, of the, the the outputs in later years, but the impact of those outputs in later in, in later years. So it is a, a bit of a sacrifice, and it is a bit of getting that balance right, having that vision as to where the overall research strategy you want to take you, uh, consciously investing time, knowing that you might be uh, investing it at the cost of some shorter term opportunities. And I have a note there about building a, a collaboration portfolio. Some collaborations will return much longer uh, in a much longer time, but much more significantly. And some short term collaborations, of course, will deliver uh, in, in a shorter time, just in, in exchanging materials and doing different measurements. But the more strategic ones, which is where uh, the big bang comes from, really do take uh, some time uh, to develop. And I, and I think being conscious of that and investing that time uh, in the medium to longer term will result in much greater impact of the, of the returns. And it's important having established collaborations that they that they're monitored, uh, that they're they don't they're not left to die or wither on the vine. Uh, that you really have to be don't establish more collaborations than you're capable of sustaining, uh, because it's important in terms of reputation that you're you're known as an, an effective and efficient collaborator. That uh, when you do set up collaborations, that uh, you make sure that there are returns from those uh, collaborations. Uh, and, and if the, the research, like all other areas of research, if the, the activity is not producing, if it, if it looks like that wasn't such a good idea, that it's important that everyone knows about that and that's communicated uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, building a reputation as a collaborator is very important. Building a reputation as a good collaborator is very important and it will determine uh, the, the nature and success of uh, future collaborations if you can make sure you get the initial ones uh, right in the early stages of your career. Uh, and you can learn from some amazing stories. Uh, this is a book by Graham Clark, Sounds from Silence. Uh, if you read that book, of course the bionic ear has been a, an amazing technological breakthrough. But there's underlying breakthroughs described in this book by Graham that are all about collaboration. Uh, think about this decades ago. Uh, that Graham, with the vision to create the bionic ear, had to break down a lot of barriers uh, through traditional disciplines to bring together a whole range of skills uh, to make that dream a reality. Uh, and he really is and was and continues to be a collaborative maestro. Uh, his insights into collaborations have helped many. His insights in this book as to how you can build collaborations and, and the significant, the highly significant impact of the returns that can come from those collaborations is really an inspiring story. And you'll also notice the timelines on there. Some of this is an investment in the future. You can get short-term returns from collaboration, 
uh, but it's the investment in the future that really delivers uh, the exciting and high impact returns uh, from significant collaborations. So that's all from me, just an introductory uh, remark, or some introductory remarks about why it's important to build collaborations, some selected points on, on how, uh, further selected points on, on when, and just reminding uh, people that when we do, when we all do establish collaborations, we have a responsibility to make sure that those collaborations are effective, uh, they're efficient, and that they deliver returns. So you're now going to hear from some of my colleagues, and I'm going to introduce Cheng Chun, first of all, uh, to just say a few words about how collaboration has been important at, at this stage of, of Cheng Chun's career. Cheng Chun's a PhD student, by the way. Hello everyone, I'm Chang Chun. Integrating electrical stimulation into the regeneration process could further man manipulate the cellular behavior and facilitate the recovery. Current stimulation systems are generally driven by external and cumbersome power source. The battery developed in my research is made up of their compatible hydrogel cathodes a biorecoverable magnesium anode, as well as the aqueous electrolyte. Getting rid of the bulky case, a bell battery is totally bell compatible in vitro and in vivo. As this is in this same plenary search involves chemistry, material, and biology, collaboration is necessary within ACES and beyond. In the big ACES family, my supervisors provide valuable advice about connections that could advance my project, and other colleagues offer professional help from their own research field. I'm also able to add value to other projects and learn about the application of my research in other fields. For instance, a novel polypure film developed by my team may find a potential sodium and battery application in Professor Fasset's growth. Through the ACES network, I'm also broadening the scope of my research and solving specific scientific problems with the help of world-leading world experts. Thanks to the help of Bill Wheeler Award, I have a chance to visit the University of Texas at Austin to explore more novel hydrogels for my research. This is a new collaboration for ACES, and it's definitely a valuable opportunity for me to learn advanced uh, fabrication methods. I'm also planning to attend the MRS conference in America in December. This international meeting provides an open platform for diverse scientific perspectives and inspires students like me. Importantly, the conference is an opportunity for me to broaden my search network and potentially find a suitable postdoc position, paving the way for my early career. I'm pleased and proud that ACES opens the door for me by providing valuable research connections. With the ACES passport in hand, we have access to the wide research network that could add value to our project and for the career. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. And uh, our next uh, presenter is Adam. Uh, Adam's been working on additive fabrication and graduated with a master's <coughs> degree in that area and is now working with us here at ACES. Hi, everyone. So yes, as Gordon said, I completed my master's uh, bioengineering focusing on additive fabrication. And in that time, I was able to design a different, a different process for uh, fused deposition modeling, so a different fabrication process. And as I transitioned from my master's into professional work, I, I sort of teetered on whether I wanted to pursue the academic line of things or if I wanted to pursue um, the professional engineering career. And for the moment, I thought it was, it, it was best for me to take the professional staff option. It gave me access to this network, uh, regardless of which, which option I chose, but I think the professional staff suits me more at my stage in the career. And my role here is to help run the different fabrication facilities we have and through the ACES network, 
I get to collaborate with a variety of different groups, whether it be industry, clinical, academic, or sort of external engagements. So primarily, when I first started here, my work was working with um, the internal collaborators within ACES. So working within our own group at UOW and within the different groups around. And that allowed me to see such a, a wider picture in terms of the science that's being done in our area that is outside of just the area that I'd specialized in. And that was great for expanding my horizons. So not only am I getting access to the different people, but it's also the different science that's happening in the area. In conjunction with that, I also get to assist with different international visitors that we get coming through here. We get to look at the different um, metal printing processes we have and how we can tune our capabilities to suit their needs. These are um, very specific areas that they might be looking at and our means of additive fabrication, they can be suited across a wide range of areas. So it's, it's great being able to take what we have and apply it to areas that we would have never thought of without these external engagements. Beyond that, I also work with different industry groups such as anatomics and local industries and also working with different clinical engagements. So we have clinicians coming to us they want specific uh, printing processes to be sort of prototyped and developed to try and ad address their needs. And I get to call on my engineering experience in my master's and start to help build up these different printers. And this is really useful for me because long term, I see myself going towards that uh, biomedical engineering side of things. I want to stay in, in the area, but still have access to both the industry, the clinical and the academic. I think it's it's going to be crucial for me going forwards, having access to this massive network. And I've only been here for two years and I've been able to see so many different aspects in terms of what printing can do for so many different areas. And I really have ACES to thank for that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Adam. And uh, the final uh, short presentation is from Bin Bin. Uh, Bin Bin completed her PhD uh, with us and since then has worked as a research fellow on a number of projects, projects and is and about to later, later in the year uh, uh, take up another exciting opportunity overseas. Uh, hand over to Bindu. Hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, this is me. I was behind, hiding behind the camera earlier. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Gordon said, I started my journey, uh, journey with ACES since 2009. Um, that was our last round of ACES actually. Um, so I did my PhD is as a um, collaborative research between uh, ACES and here in CRC. Uh, and I did my uh, project on drug delivery system using different methods, either with uh, connecting polymers or 3D printing techniques. And after I finished my PhD, I moved on to take uh, the postdoc position with ACES and uh, uh, then further developed uh, my project into 3D printing of biomaterials uh, using a scaffold for tissue engineering. And the, I'm currently uh, going back, I currently coming back from to the uh, here in CRC role. So for this year before I'm uh, going to Japan and uh, I'm working on the here in CRC project, um, investigating the uh, surface chemistry and uh, uh, interface uh, properties of um, electro uh, bio interface uh, for the cochlear implant uh, applications. Um, so, uh, looking back to my journeys in um, uh, ACES, I would say um, actually uh, not only that I I was able to build my links um, with people through ACES, which I will talk later and also uh, actually my whole career or journey so far was built on the collaboration that ACES established and then help people um, to develop their career. So um, during my PhD I was able to uh, go to US to uh, attend a conference and uh, have a lab visit in Fermi University which established by the visiting of Professor Hanks to uh, IPRI a uh, couple of years earlier. Uh, and uh, also I'm currently have ongoing collaborative research uh, with Abu Atad Academy University from Finland. And we have visitors visiting us at the moment. Um, so uh, my, um, my grant that I got that would take me to Japan for 
to do my research for two years. That was actually um, that should say I should say it was date back to last year when we had our ACE symposium in Deakin. That um, Professor Fukuda's group they sent a group of students to visit us and present, and their research really interested me. And I start to chatting with his students, the visitors, um, and I always had that in my mind. Uh, and then uh, later in the year, when the JSPS um, scholarship award coming up, uh, and that uh, requires a visit to a Japan. Uh, laboratory, and that first thing came into my mind. I think, well, that's a good opportunity for me to actually would uh, go further on this research that I'm interested in. Uh, so yeah, so like I said, I benefited uh, from the ACES um, that um, either the link that ACES already having with the other uh, institute, and also with all the uh, visitors that would come to visit us and uh, had opportunity to. Talk to them and then uh, to build up the network uh, through ACES. That's all from me. Great. Okay, thank you, Bin Bin. And uh, I think that's the end of our presentations. I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we do anything from here. Uh, next, we're going to take questions. Okay. So questions. Has anybody <laughs> got any questions out there? So people can leave a Um, maybe we'll start. I, actually, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> okay. When we um, decide to do this um, presentation, so um, do you think, as an early career researcher or even PhD student, when we go to the conference or we, when we go to visit other institutes that we some we give um, presentations, do you think like people sitting in the audience, senior people, uh, what Quality, or uh, they will be looking into, and what would interest them when you when you give the presentation, and what should we address during those presentations? Yeah, so look, I think when we all go to conferences, of course, we put first and foremost, as we should do, the quality of the the technical aspects of our presentation. We're all excited about the research that we individually do, and and we present it with great enthusiasm, as we should, uh, and and. And that still is the primary, uh, the primary marker, I think, of, of a good researcher. Uh, but more and more people are looking, of course, at uh, individuals' ability to communicate. And of course, a conference provides that opportunity uh, to show your communication skills, not just during the presentation, but uh, prior to it and afterwards in terms of interacting uh, with individuals. Uh, and also, it's an opportunity to demonstrate that you know uh, how important collaboration is and that you've been experienced in it or you've had examples and you've been able to do that. And of course, that's a chance also to, to acknowledge your collaborators in a real tangible way. And as I mentioned before, it's important to monitor progress. Uh, it's important to celebrate success, uh, celebrate that success together. And, and that real tangible acknowledgement, not, not just on a slide at the end of the presentation, but throughout the presentation, a tangible acknowledgement of of collaborators uh, is important uh, in that regard, but also important in it demonstrates your skills. So it's the technical skills, the communication skills, and the collaboration skills. I, I think in putting a presentation together, you should be trying to frame it uh, so that you're demonstrating all of those. Yeah, I think we got a uh, question from the audience. So we got a question from Steffi, Stephania. Uh, so, if you have your preferred industry partner you want to make uh, link with, how would you um, proceed? Yeah, look, I think it's important as quickly as possible to get personal introductions to the appropriate people uh, in that company. So, again, uh, if possible, uh, using existing networks, and they are extensive in Australia, uh, to see if that company is working within those networks where you might be able to uh, approach uh, the key researcher in that network or the CEO or the research director to help get you a personal introduction to the right people. Uh, because as we've emphasized during our talks here today, it, it really does come down to talking to the right people. It, you know, and particularly in a big company, you could spend a lot of time uh, not progressing things very well 
Uh, whereas if you can get the right individual, uh, you can progress them much more quickly. So as much as possible, use existing networks to identify the right people in that company. Um, yeah, so uh, actually have a following up question on that. Um, is that preferred to connect, contact with the uh, R&D department directly or, uh, or management? Uh, it, look, it comes down to the individuals. So, you know, use use existing networks, uh, use conferences. You know, if, if there's somebody from that company who's attending a conference or uh, is presenting at a conference and you have the opportunity to get face-to-face -face time with those individuals, I think that's very important. Uh, I, I think, you know, just a, a blind uh, inter sorry, a, a blind contact uh, really does take a long time to work through uh, company processes. So I'd, I'd be looking to try and make contact on as many levels as possible, but with as many individuals as possible, you know, not just a PO box uh, that you might send something to. Yeah. Uh, I guess, uh, so Sarah, I will take that question after the next one. So we got one from Tu Le. Uh, it's still a following up question. How do you handle the IP issues with collaborating with industry? Yeah, so look, most universities have got standard uh, ways to deal with, with IP. Uh, I think the important thing in the first stages is that everybody is covered by a non-disclosure agreement so that if any IP is developed, that it, it's not uh, threatened, that it's protected under that non-disclosure agreement. Uh, and, and then I think it's a matter for a particular collaboration as to how the IP is handled. Uh, in, in general, it's better for the commercial entity to be driving developments in the IP, they, they understand uh, where the commercial opportunity is. And, and let's face it, a, a patent is a, a commercial document. If it's not going to be turned into a commercial opportunity, then it's not really worth uh, pursuing it. So I think, and, and that's the other reason why it's so important uh, to collaborate with industry. They have an intelligence and a network in the commercial sectors that we don't have. And it's, it's the combination of that research intelligence and network with the commercial intelligence and network that really makes it quite quite powerful so it it it's horses for courses uh, but really doing uh, thinking about up, up front is important uh, and and talking to your collaborator up front about it so that they they know that you're aware of developments in ip how important they are uh, how important it is to protect them how important it is to work with the commercial entity in developing them uh, so maybe now I'll take the question from Sarah, that's to me. How did I make my uh, industry um, connections during my PhD? Uh, so uh, like I said, my um, PhD project was a collaborative project between ACES and here in CRC. Uh, the nature of CRC they, is that they already have, they have to find an industry partner um, and uh, uh, so um, which which already they have an existing industry network there, uh, and uh, also we were able to attend the symposiums and also um, all the um, between in the here in CRC. So, uh, yeah. So it's just part of that. Um, so uh, I was able to meet people from uh, Cochlear, um, and uh, uh, in that way, um, I guess it was easier to me um, to make industrial links during my PhD. Yeah. Um, Maybe we'll take one more question if there is one, and then we'll yep. better wrap up. <laughs> uh, we see someone's typing here, so we'll wait for that. Um, also, I guess, um, is, Gordon, as you said, mentioned, there is a, a, a portfolio of the collaboration we need to build. And based on your experience, how long do we expect to have those formal uh, collaboration goings starting from we need surely get in contact with people? Um, yeah. yeah, sometimes so it seems to be a really long process. It, yeah, sometimes it is. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we've been collaborating uh, with Graham Clark, for example, for a couple of decades now. And uh, of course, we've done some very exciting uh, work with Graham. But, but some of the, the, the others, and, and that was building a whole new strategic research area and so, the, so the impact of that, of course, was huge. Uh, but some of the others are, are much shorter term. Uh, I didn't use a specific example before, but you can imagine 
in our activities uh, where we synthesize and pr process graphene, for example, it, the collaboration might be as simple as supplying uh, our graphene to someone for particular applications because we know the properties of it, working with them in a collaborative sense to develop that application. And, and there you're looking at turnaround time of you know a few months. And so that's what I meant by that portfolio of collaborations. It's a bit like investing in, in shares, I guess. Not that I do that, but, uh, but uh, I guess it's a bit like that uh, in that you want some short-term returns, medium-term returns, and, and longer-term investments. You know, but, uh, you need that balance uh, to really get the most impact out of a, 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 the, the collaborative portfolio. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're taking our last question from Tulu. Um, so the question is, do you usually collaborate with other researchers who don't have your skills and expertise or with someone with similar skill sets to advance yours? Uh, you, usually it's uh, with those who have complementary expertise uh, or have a need or can identify a challenge that, that we haven't identified. Uh, that they're, that's usually the, the nature of the collaborations. But, but having said that, and particularly in the early stages of career development, of course, it's, it is a great opportunity to learn from those who are expert in your own field. Uh, and so both, both types of collaborations could be very fruitful. Yeah, I, I think I can uh, to in with with little to be with little my experience. I know when I was doing my PhD, uh, just by talking to the experts in the field, you can actually uh, learn a lot from them. And by getting in that first contact with them, you never know what would lead you later on in your career when you are uh, able to uh, further develop the project. Yeah. So I'll ask Ching Chun or Adam, do they want to add uh, anything in our farewell remarks? Our webcam's gone off. But the, <laughs> but the camera's gone off. Yeah. yeah. We have a take out glitch out. Yeah, yep, they're back. Hi, everyone. Oh, I think I just muted my microphone again, sorry. No, no, we're back. Yeah, so I'll just ask Ching Chun or Adam if they want to add anything in our closing remarks? Um, I guess from my my aspect, coming from the professional side of things as opposed to necessarily the straight um, academic link, it's the capabilities that you have that other people can find applications for that has been such a big driving force for the way I've found networks. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been in the area long, but to me, I've seen that to be great for a lot of short-term links that could progress into something more, but I, I haven't seen them yet. Mm. Jim, did you want to yeah, say? Yeah, you know, as uh, you know, before I came to IPR, I don't have the background of the biology, but currently after two years learning and collaboration, I could do some researches involving the chemistry and the material and the biology. It's, it's quite good for, for the PhD students, yeah. I think. And, yeah. and, and learning to communicate with other people in those yeah, areas, yeah. not necessarily getting all the skills yourself, but yeah. those communication skills are really important. Yeah, we important. can learn from each other. Yeah. Anything else from them? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would address that. I think the collaboration would really help, uh, not just during the PhD, also, also in the early career research uh, period. And actually, I think that would actually shape the direction of the career path. For, uh, for us. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely um, go collaborating. Yeah, and go collaborating. <laughs> and build that collaborative portfolio. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, if there's any further questions, of course, drop us an email. Uh, we, we don't all have the definitive answers and the best way to collaborate or the best way to build collaborations. So today was really just about sowing the seeds, giving some ideas, uh, posing some challenges. and. Uh, I think we all need to keep working on this together. We need to be as innovative in the ways that we collaborate as we are innovative in the way we do scientific and engineering research. And if we can build that innovative approach to collaboration, uh, we'll continue to build those networks and really uh, reap uh, amazing returns from them. So thanks for joining us and uh, hopefully you'll join us on our next webinar. Bye. Bye.